Cooperative Legacy Project interview number 39, December, or December, June 8th, 2006. We're visiting with Matt Bergen, Clay County Farmers Union, and cooperative, cooperative activist and former member of the Board of Directors of the Farmers Union Marketing and Processing Association. Matt, uh, where and when were you born? I was born right on this farm, Section 25 in Clay County, in 19... 29, August 25th. Okay. And where was your family originally from before they ended up here in Clay County? My dad was this was born on uh, half a mile north on, in Union County, just across the road. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And before that, way back? Well, uh, my granddad, Matt Bergen, was uh, born in uh, Wisconsin. Hmm. Yeah, in but that's where he was born, mm -hmm. so uh, probably his folks are from Luxembourg. Luxembourg, yeah. 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 Okay, I, now yeah. I would have thought Bergen was a German name. Well, yeah, Luxembourg, it's it's, a, it's spelled a B I R G E N, yeah. 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 See? Yeah. So. Well, you're the first uh, person I've interviewed from Luxembourg, whose ancestry is in Luxembourg. Yes, well, yeah, so my uh, dad's mother was a uh, uh, Merrigan, so she was Irish, and then the rest, and then. Okay. And of course, so then I'm a Luxembourg Irish, and my mother was full German. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And did you have brothers and sisters? I had uh, uh, three sisters and uh, one brother that uh, was about a year and a half older, and I was a died at five days. Mm -hmm. okay. I was the youngest in the family. And I think you mentioned what your father's name, but that was my Nicholas Nick Nicholas. Nick Nick Bergen. Nick Bergen. Okay. That's my dad, but that was my granddad was mm -hmm. Matt Bergen. Yeah, you want to talk a little bit about your dad? You always give people a chance to talk about their parents. What sort of a guy was he? Well, my dad, he was. Uh, that's how I got started in farmers union and the cooperatives because mm -hmm. he was a original. Uh, director to start when the Tri-County Farmers Union started in Beer Shirt. And then they had the community grocery store, so he was a director on that. Mm -hmm. And when he retired in um, from the Tri-County Farmers Union, which was Truck Town, they just built it in 1964, then I got elected on the board, which I served for 21 years, but I was on too many boards, so I just resigned from that board. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, he, we belonged to... Uh, uh, Union County Prairie Local Farmers Union, and uh, he was secretary of the board uh, in the local county, in the local. And I can remember he's talking about Farmers Union. He went to, uh, he got a, a little pig, I think it's still laying out, a tin pig, and made it out, and put that on top of the old Model Lake car and went over to a Farmers Union convention over in Yankton. And they had Prairie Local on their number on there. And I, I know we kept it around here pretty soon. It got thrown away from one of the buildings, you know. But, mm -hmm. but we used to go to the farmers' union meetings, you know. And that was the only thing that there was going on at them times, you know. Yeah. yeah. And and of course he farmed his horses, and he went into the tractor, uh, 1941 John Deere, his only tractor that he really bought, you know. And then I started farming after that. Okay. And your mother. My mother was uh, lived uh, north of Beershirt, and uh, they got uh, she she had uh, they got married in 1919, and then they moved to this farm, and that's where they lived all the time, and, uh, and then of course that's where I was born, and and then we uh, Marine and I when we got married we lived just a half mile north of the farm that I'd bought when I came out of the army, and then we switched around at your 1960 and they moved up there and we moved here. We were married for five years and our family got too big so we moved here. So my mother, yeah, she just, uh, she probably uh, worked on the farm and and didn't have that much schooling, you know, you know, not that much grade school, you know. Just like my dad, you know, they only went so many, maybe six years probably. And a hard worker and vegetables and gardens, you know, and everything. What are some of your uh, early memories from the farm when you were a kid in the uh, 30s, I suppose? Hmm? Yeah. Into the early 40s? Well, uh, heavy snowstorms. Heavy snowstorms. <laughs> yeah. In 36, I think it was. They, 
this was they made 77 out here because there was so much snow they had to use the road here because it went by here and and people come with shovels and cats and try to open the road and and of course uh, it, it was dirty and windy and poor crops and and everybody had a tough time yeah, right but, uh, hot dry windy summers and cold snowy winters yeah. low prices for tomorrow. low prices yeah right mm -hmm. um Let's see here. You you mentioned your dad had been had been active in Farmers Union. Uh, that was started. When did the Tri County Farmers Union start down here? Was that pretty early? I think about in forty three. Oh, okay. so, I think so. Okay. Nineteen forty three. So but I can remember <clears throat> talking about. It. We used to have the uh, you know locals Farmers Union meetings in the schoolhouses, and I can remember we were at Sunnyside School. One time it was going to have a a meeting over there and so the teacher was just a mile and a half south here lived and so folks said well you walk down there and get the key because uh, we got to get into that building tonight to have farmers union meeting and she uh, well i walked down there and when she come from the school then she said she left the door open so then i had to walk back so that was three miles for the so we go there to the local meeting night and then as far as the farmers union they used to always have an oyster stew a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. They had them in the Odd Fellows Hall or the old Legion Hall or I don't know what their different occasions were, you know. Even when after I got on started with uh, in Clay County, when I got more active in it, that still had the oyster stew, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were younger, did you have uh, did you always want to farm? Well, did I guess other ideas at some point. I guess I was just raised in farming and yep. And uh, they were, I was the only son, and uh, I guess I just was, I started, and that's what it was. I started uh, planting corn and farming when I was 18, and then I got drafted in the Army when I was 21, and, and, uh, and then I come back. I guess I, I never gave it a thought. For, I never went to college. So I never gave it a thought for anything else but uh, the farming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, one of the other things that we've talked to people about was was uh, country school. Did you go to country school? Oh, definitely. Same school that my dad went to, and and uh, see how many kids of ours went to the same school? Uh, all, five of them. Five of them went all at the same school until it closed. Okay, the two yeah, what, younger girls. Yeah, where was that at? It was right over here. It was two miles from here. Mm -hmm. Sunnyside. Okay, what was that like back when you when you were a kid? Well, thirties, I suppose. Yeah, it's uh, had the old uh, stove uh, furnace down the basement. You had the heat from the, come up the register and outside bathrooms or toilets, I guess it was mm -hmm. WPA toilets. Oh, the WPA built toilets too. Yeah, yeah, okay. and uh, then there was an old barn out there, but uh, no, uh, some kids would ride a horse once in a while. Mm -hmm. I rode a horse once to school, but otherwise we. We walked or rode a bicycle to school, mm -hmm. yeah. but that's the same school my dad had went to, and he showed where he had planted a tree there at the school and different too. Okay, did you carve your name on the desk, or did they do anything? I vandal? can't can't remember. I suppose <laughs> I'm, full, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. I'm sure. Okay, I'm uh, sure. The schoolhouse still stands in Beersheet. Oh, it, it isn't being used. The fellow brought it. And he moved it up there in Beershire. I don't know if he's going to make a garage out of it. It just sits there yet, in the north end of Beershire. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, a few of them are left. Uh, yeah. There's actually, you go out west, and there's still some of them being used. Being used, right. Yeah. We, we just recently uh, marked an anniversary of the rural electrification uh, legislation. Do you remember when the... When, when we got, like, when you got electricity down here. Okay. Well, we had, uh, we didn't get it until 1947. Uh, it, uh, and then my dad dug the poles. There was a lot of trees lying, sawed the trees down by hand. Him and a neighbor, 
and then they dug the poles by hand and to get it because it we were kind of in the end of it and and he did have a a wind charger thirty two volt and of course that's all you had was lights more or less you know uh but then we was pretty happy when we got that nineteen forty seven when we got that's the year I graduated from high school mm -hmm. and we got the uh, electricity it finally came true, but you had to do a lot of hard work to get it you know yeah you remember what it was like the first uh, time you flipped well you you say you had electric lights yeah right. we had thirty two volt right so, okay so yeah. you don't quite have that memory for that. no some people do well no, I remember the kerosene mm -hmm. lamps and the yeah. lanterns but, yeah and going out to milk the cows, you know, with the lantern and everything else, you know. Mm -hmm. Was that, you talked about the wind charger, was that a pretty good size thing? Or? No, 32 volt, it wasn't too big. It uh, it just had four big batteries. Okay. And uh, if you wanted to listen to the radio or anything, you had to, the wind had to be glowing, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then it'd take off one and then the lights would get brighter and sometimes they'd be dimmer, you know, because there wasn't much juice, it didn't restore, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I know there was one at our place, and I, I don't remember using it, but uh, they used it just to charge batteries for the radio, so I think maybe it was only one battery. I don't okay. Uh, the light plants that my uncle had up the road where my granddad lived, they had 16 batteries, and that was a gas generator. And so mm -hmm. I suppose that would mm -hmm. carry on. That was a 32 volt, too, but that would carry longer. You know. Okay. Okay, now is that what uh, another person I interviewed called a Delco charger? Is I, that what that I'm would sure be? that's what that would be. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, do you, uh, what do you remember about uh, life here on the home front during World War II? You were, uh, what, uh, 11, 12 when the war started? Right. Well, the rations of everything and the gasoline, you could only get so much you had to have a, for your car. And uh, everything was rationed sugar, you know, you couldn't get sugar. That was a big thing because the folks, when they bought sugar and flour and everything was all by the 100 pounds, you know, and it got rationed. And uh, I guess Marine can tell you that ever, they had rations, she can remember too. Mm -hmm. You know, everything was rationed. Uh, you know, it was, it was something else. And then I can remember we trashed, they had a lot of the soldiers, I think it was the signal school in Sioux Falls, I think that, and, and during the, couldn't get help, you know, so come trashing time, and they, my uncle, he hired some uh, uh, soldiers from Sioux Falls that came out and shocked the, corn, uh, the grain, oats. Really? And uh, I started pitching bundles because my dad had a trash machine, and he used a tin separator, and my uncle was the engineer. And so he tended separator, and then he always hired a man to pitch bundles. Well, it got to be there was no men to, to haul bundles, so I started hauling bundles when I was 13, mm -hmm. 12 to thir 12 and a half, 13. So I can remember that. I started out young to pitch bundles, and, of course, uh, then the next year, I guess, uh, did the same thing, you know. So mm -hmm. I got started in there early because that affected from the war, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and then I can always remember when the, the war was over, I think it was August 15th, <clears throat> the buses, the old uh, Greyhound bus coming down Interstate, I mean 77, Highway 77, tooting the horn, that the war was over, you know. But, okay. But, um, yeah, it was, yeah, you always saw, like in Falls, they had that base up there, you'd see uh, GIs hitchhiking, you know, around. Mm -hmm. Was it the, common for them to come out and work on, at harvest time? Well, they uh, they left them come out, I guess, try to help the farmers out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been talking about the war. Do you remember Pearl Harbor? Or, or right, or, yeah. Or, or <clears throat> uh, of course, that was on Sunday, and then I, yeah, I just remember vaguely of it you know we didn't have that better good a radio yeah. but I know we talked about it at school Monday the next day then mm -hmm. a lot you know because mm -hmm. other people had better radios than we did yeah. we didn't get that much news yeah 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 uh, high school where did you, did you attend high school beer, beer shirt the four years yeah okay. I didn't participate in any sports I came home to work FFA, of course, egg okay, was into that. They did have uh, boy egg. You know, right, those yeah. Those mm -hmm. okay. That was just mostly, it was just for boys at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was strong into that. 
Was that relatively new then, or no? Well, I suppose FFA was fairly new, yes. Oh. I was an uh, officer in, in the FFA. Oh, you okay. Know. Okay. When did, uh, when did you and Maureen meet? When did you folks meet? Uh, right when I, see, 50, 54. 53. When you got out of the service? 53. See. <laughs> we got married at 55. Mm -hmm. I, we, yeah, we met at 54. Then. 54. Yeah, 54, yeah. Uh, see, I was in the Army from 52 to 53, and I come back in January and uh, then uh, went over to Swan Lake and I met her at a dance in May, later part of May, on a Friday night, like, say, May 20th or something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, met her at the dance, and then we uh, uh, went together, and, of course, I had a... Uh, I think shortly after that, I was shocked out. We had this old trash machine, and uh -huh. the neighbors had used it. Instead of backing it into the trees, they pulled it forward in there. And I went in with the tractor to get the trash machine out, and I ran a tree branch in my right eye. So I spent, I've been, can't see out of the right eye. And then she, I can remember she came up to the hospital to see me. That was in July, wasn't it? Yeah. And then I guess we got engaged the last part of November, and we got married in uh, 1955 or June 2nd. Oh, okay. okay. Um, you mentioned uh, the, the getting drafted. Uh, that was in 1952 during the Korean War? Right. See, yeah, 50. Yeah, 50. Yeah, we got drafted. Took my physical on 51 of August, and we got a, a greetings to come to the to go like in September right away but they had to give us a deferment because there was so many of them they did it too quick but they needed so many GIs to go so when we went in the 8th of January of 52 there was 60 of us from Beershirt went in got drafted and they went different places some went to the infantry and some I went to the chemical corps in Alabama and spent one year in Alabama and one year in Korea Okay. and uh, then the truce was signed in uh, and I was over in Korea in, in uh, 53, January, July 27th. Okay, what was it like down in Alabama? It was hot, and it took basic training there. It was, uh, it was, it was, the it was, was so much different uh, how they their homes and everything were built. You know, everybody they had their houses were built up on stilts, more or less, because oh. they'd have these heavy rains in February and March, and they'd always have tornadoes and stuff around. And uh, even our uh, barracks, well, I, I spent most of the time in tents. They had some, some barracks. Where were you located at now? In Fort McClellan, Alabama. Okay. And I, then I, I went to leadership school, and I came home at, from Alabama and uh, to help my dad because he had cut he, hurt his hand. So I got a, a deferment for, not a deferment, a military leave for a month to help harvest crops in 52 Mm -hmm. And then I went back, and I was back in supply room, and then I, uh, at the end of the, that year, like in December, they had a big push to go to Korea. They needed people, so then mm -hmm. I, I had to go to Korea, and we took the boat over to Korea, and I mean to Japan, and got our, our combat uh, equipment, and three days later, then we went to Korea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And where were you on the line? Were you up on, at the front? Yes, we were uh, near Pan Moon Jong. Mm. Okay. We were on. We went on the first of May, and that was. I can always remember when there was. Uh, they had these prisoners. There was exchanging, mm -hmm. and they. We were right close by there, and we saw the train pull into that area, and we were in. Actually, in our area, it was a non-shooting in or out because of the of Pan Moon John was uh, real close to that. Mm -hmm. And, and with the peace talks going on. There. Right, right, and then uh, we were on line for nine weeks. And then I think we pulled back, and then the truce was signed like the Sunday, uh, 27th of July at 10 o'clock, and then we had to move again for to get for the DMZ zone. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And to add something to that, uh, in 1998, Marine and I went back to Korea, which I never thought we'd do, and uh, they had a Korean revisit for veterans and their wives, uh -huh. and very interesting. But everything was so changed, so different. Everything yeah. just it was just so barren over there, and we got there in '98. Everybody had a cell phone in a car, 
and pavements and, and condominiums that 22, 24, <laughs> neighbor, neighbor. No, no poverty there, no. No, neighbor, the neighbor went with us. Uh, he was in with 25th Division too. Yep. And uh, we just couldn't believe that. And I, cause she, they had museums there to show how it had been, the old Mama Sons and Papa Sons, so she enjoyed that, yeah. I think that was one of her better trips. Mm -hmm. of, that was interesting. But to get back to the Korean, <clears throat> where we didn't have anything to spend money on, and we got paid $50 more for online, which we didn't get very much money, but I saved money and sent it home, because you didn't have to spend it on, and that's where we bought our down payment on our first farm. Oh, okay. So I, I wanted to bring that into the farm. And, yeah. Farm prices for land was a little cheaper than it yeah, is today around here? Yeah, I paid $180 an acre. And we bought an 80, and my dad bought that 80, and then we as we paid. Had, we had quite a time to make the payments because it was dry and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that was just a half a mile north here. Oh, okay. That's okay. where. Is there a farm that, still up there? Right. That yeah, farm that's where Larry did. And we had um, we lived there for five years, and then, like I said, then the folks we our family got too big, so we changed places and built a better house up there for the folks who moved up there. What was it like when you got home then? You, uh, well, we, we hear about Korea maybe being what, what they call the Forgotten War. Or, yeah. Uh, people didn't forget about it right then. But. No, it. Um, we uh, we uh, took the ship back. Of course, going over it was really rough, and it, more people got sick. But coming home, your attitude was different. Mm -hmm. And I went out of Fort uh, Camp Stoneman out of California. But we came back. We went into Fort Lewis in and, and, and Washington. And I can always remember the night that uh, we got out. I went with uh, not a we we had a, a little time before midnight. We our train was leaving to go to Camp. Colorado. It was Fort Colorado now, but that's where he got separated. And went into NCO Club, and they're doing the bunny hop. Ooh. And <laughs> it was something different to see that, you know. It was, and then I, I can remember when I come back, it was, uh, they had TVs, you know. And I just, I just, I didn't travel around very much because, first because it was just such a, a change, you know. It just, uh, just kind of set. And I know we were sitting in a bar, and everybody said, He's sure looking at that TV, and you don't say anything. You just sit there and watch the TV, but it was a, I don't know, a whole new life, you know. Yeah. Then, of course, you, yeah. you got back to it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh. mm -hmm. Did you, did, speaking of television, did you get television around here right away or not? No, folks, we didn't get television until 56, Reen and I did. I don't know if I folks, no, the folks didn't have it. They didn't buy it first, mm -hmm. no. So the first TV was in 1956, but yeah. Okay. But uh, other people had TVs and you used to see them. Of course, at that time they didn't have color either. It was just uh, I think on a Wednesday night there was color, mm -hmm. and then the black and white. Uh, there was only so many stations. What was there? About Sioux Falls, Sioux City, and Sioux Falls. You know. Okay, so you had two stations here or three? Yeah. So two or three. I'm not sure. Well, there was Channel 4 and Channel 9 yeah. and 11 in the Falls, of course, and I don't know when 13 come in. 14 was the color TV one, I think. Really? But, uh, yeah. That was Sioux City. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <coughs> okay. And uh, then we get to kids. You have how many kids? Seven. Seven, seven children. All right, and they are. Gives you a chance to test you, see if you can remember all their names. <laughs> oh, Ken, Connie, Chuck, Carol Lee, Larry, Deb, and Mary. And I can tell you, I don't know what, forget their age, but I can tell you what their birthday is. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. And. Uh, and they uh, they all went through the farmers union. All went through, right. all went to farmers union. I all never, mm -hmm. well, I never uh, went to camp or anything in farmers union, but yeah. they didn't. Yeah. yeah. Was, uh, was were you uh, active as a youth leader, Maureen? Um, I was county education director for a few years when our kids were 
going through the program because after Dennis Lennis Larson quit, then then I started for a few years there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I can't remember how long. Maybe maybe eight years. I don't know. At least. Yeah, eight or ten. I don't know how long. When did your last, uh, the last of the kids complete the program? It's a little while ago. Mm. Well, Mary is. She's the youngest one, isn't she? Yeah. She, when she graduated, she she was born in 1970, so she graduated in 80, 88, 88, eight, yeah. 88. I suppose she got her Torchbearer Award in 89 then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she went along. When we went to the national convention, mm-hmm. she had went as a speaker, as a youth speaker. Well, she was a page at page. the national convention. And then she go along. She went to two conventions. Went to Oklahoma and yeah, to Arkansas. Yeah, she was on the on the communications. I think they used to send a youth sometime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She went to Oklahoma and then she went to Arkansas, too. Okay. And she spoke at Arkansas. Yeah. Okay. Now that was that would be kind of unusual for the young. Know, people to go to two conventions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Torchbearers got to go to one, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so she got to go to two. So, because yeah. she went with us because we went to the conventions all the time. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, some of the, your kids were on summer staff, right? Right. Uh, how many of them? No, Ken was before he was educated. Yeah, he was education, and Chuck was on summer staff. Yes. I don't think the other girls were. I don't think were. any of the other ones were. They had, you know, they get into jobs and stuff, mm-hmm. and they couldn't, couldn't mm-hmm. do it. So I think that's all. Yeah. You you probably haven't heard all the stories about your kids telling about summer staff, but some of us on staff did. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you you yeah. heard a lot of stories. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then of course, Ken was education director from I think '79 to '82. You. Yeah, he got married. Yeah, he moved out to Colorado in '82 because he got married then. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't. Then he started for Rocky Mountains. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I don't know how many years he was on there. Yeah. Then he went back to teaching. Right. Mm-hmm. Now he went to South Dakota State. Did they all, right. they all go to college? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They all went to college. Yeah. Uh, most of them went to state, except when Deb went to Vermilion, and Carol went to Dakota State and. Madison and Mary, she went to Spearfish. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. The boys all went to state. Mm-hmm. And, and Connie, yeah. part time. But yeah. she finished up in. She finished in. Familiar. The U then. Yeah. Ken taught somewhere down in Iowa before he went to work. Yeah, for uh, half a year. And he was education. I mean, he was a coach of football and wrestling. Mm-hmm. Way down the southeast corner. Yeah. Three schools. And yeah, he, did he, play, he played football. Right. He uh, he was a walk-on, and uh, of course we got uh, 50-yard tickets, and he was for on there two years. But he had an old injury from wrestling that he had to have surgery on his knee, so then he quit. And then he was a trainer with the football field a team. Okay. Okay. And we got letters encouraged to encourage him to go back into playing, but uh, he had hurt his knee so much and he had surgery, so he thought he just he just quit playing then. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, well, we at this point we come back around, uh, at least in my uh, narrative here, we come back around to, uh, to uh, cooperatives. And uh, you want to talk a little bit about what about your time on the, uh, was, the was Tri-County the first cooperative you were, board you were on? Right, that was you in. You said your dad was on. He was on there, the original, original the board. The board here. Where was the store at? You mentioned that. Right downtown. And uh, the grocery store, I I wasn't on that. My dad was on that. But then they had about three, two other grocery stores, Consul Oak and some more. And we were, it was in about 56, they probably closed their doors of the community. And uh, it it made it so hard for them, these chain stores to come in and make it hard for their community's groceries. But other people used to say to us, I wish that store was still there because it was holding the prices down, you know. But then... They had more of a leverage on, like Consul Oak and did, and then there was a few other smaller stores. But uh, we did all our grocery shopping there at the community grocery store. Well, to start out, Tri County had 
a grocery store with the groceries and different things like twine and everything else, you know. Mm-hmm. And then they didn't have room for that, so then they split off. And then my dad was a director from the community grocery store and for Tri County. And they started a grocery store uh, separate, and I forget how many years that ran. Mm-hmm. And so then uh, they moved out in 1964 to Trucktown, and they built the, the plaza up there. And then my dad had been a board of directors for 25 years, I believe. And then I had a, a, uh, I got elected in 64. And then I think I was on until 1982. Mm-hmm. I was reelected, but then we had a little financial problems and, and some of the people wanted to do away with Senex, but then the farmers union from Elsister bought them out in beer shooting. And I resigned from the board because I was on AMPI regional co-op uh, Milk producer board and fumpa board, and I just absolutely couldn't have that too much. T- took too much time for all the boards I was on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, what sort of problems was it at Tri County that, that they got into? Was it oh, credit, uh, credit, credit, credit issues, yeah, which credit issues. In the case. Right, that was a big thing. Didn't have a too good of a credit policy, and mm-hmm. and that's what happened, and. Uh, otherwise, uh, Senex uh, was, they held the, the money, we got a board of money from them, and they said either pay up or otherwise this is mm-hmm. what you have to do. Yeah. Did, did the members lose their equity or did they? Did they got some back later, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Not like, I don't know what's going to happen now, I won't even talk yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and and Truck Town at that time was the facility that's on the east side of the... No, on the west side. Of the highway? Yeah. The interstate. Really? Okay. Yeah. The east side, that, that was bought later, yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. All right. And I was fortunate to be on the resolution committee in 1982 mm-hmm. at the Senate. Okay. And uh, 82 was up in, in the, that's when Dwayne Mortensen uh, lost his position to Trap Hagen. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. You mentioned uh, AMPI. You were uh, you were dairy farming. Are you right. still doing any? Oh no. That? Uh, we. I was uh, on the dis- divisional director, and then in 1980, I become a regional director. Uh, for nine years, I was on that, and then in, they got inspection got so they we were uh, grade B manufacture milk and the inspections was this is tough for that as grade A was coming and we'd have to to uh, renew our or build up or remodel our facilities and so and Larry didn't care to go into that dairying so we just quit in 1989 mm-hmm. sold the cows out and quit mm-hmm. and a lot of farmers did at that time yeah. before that there had been some buyouts a lot of people quit yeah. but I stayed on until 1989 yeah. Now, the buyouts were federal, a federal program, right? right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, and the inspection was that uh, was that mandated by the feds or was that primarily state? Uh, that was state. Well, feds had some, but a state because each state had their own deal. Inspection. See, South Dakota first they used to have C milk. There was A, B, and C. Yeah. C was the canned milk, and South Dakota did away with the canned milk first because mm-hmm. I know Minnesota still had it, and we used to, and then they kept throwing on more inspections all the time and I went with some more of the AMPI directors and we went to Pier and lobbied for that we had enough inspections because it was costing our company every time they come out to inspect it cost us so much money and it was coming out of the producers pockets and I was fortunate to go to and Marine went along too to once she did we went to Washington DC to lobby for milk prices and I went to uh, three times total Mm-hmm. when I was on the regional board. Was that uh, time-consuming, serving on the regional board? Uh, we had a meeting every, every month. We would have it for two days. And then we had some uh, different district meetings, uh, I think divisional meetings. We'd have four, four a year, too, besides in the falls. But we had them at New Alm or Mankato, wherever they'd be. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was consuming. 
Okay, now you also uh, mentioned uh, marketing and processing. Uh, you, what year did you go on that board? 19, I guess you should look on the right chart out here. Get the right. Mm -hmm. Nineteen eighty three to two thousand one. Okay. I was thinking I was gonna say eighty two, but it was eighty three. Okay. I suppose because uh, it probably it was curious. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose it was probably in eighty two I got elected in November. Yeah. It was Adam side Dallas position, so I suppose I started like in eighty three, say mm -hmm. January. Mm -hmm. Up until that time, uh, I think uh, was this when they they changed over from, it was Farmers Union State Organization directors who served on the board. Yes, right. And at that point, uh, right. I think all the other states had changed previous. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. Mm -hmm. So you were one of the first. Uh, right, for one of the, it wasn't a, a state board, yeah. yeah. Adam was, well, before that, Leaf, Leaf Lunder was before Adam. Mm -hmm. And see, he was a director yeah. from, and then Adam, of course, the vice president. And of course, Paul Simmons and, has carried on on that. Uh, yeah. I mean, he was a, he went on first as a state director. Oh, yeah, so. okay. And they had a, a 65 age limit. That's how come Leaf had to go off and, and how come uh, Adam had to go off. Oh. And Adam come to me and asked me if I would run. Mm -hmm. In the first year, I had competition. Okay. Okay. And of course, uh, you see that we used to always sell our livestock to Farmers Union Commission from which was part of FUMPA mm -hmm. in Sioux City and Sioux Falls. And later, Sioux yeah. City was closed and we still had Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. So, the later years. Okay. Would you like to talk about, uh, the, uh, about some, of the, some of the issues and decisions you had to make during the years when you were on the FUMPA board? Well, the one thing was that uh, we used to, uh, of course, it was uh, the Renron company. Uh, it got so that cattle, the hide prices wasn't that good. So we had a, they still have the Renron, but it's not making money. It wasn't, hadn't been for mm -hmm. years. So, and it only was about 88% of the, the, the of, uh, business. And of course, we always look for new deal something new to deal we took over midwest greece was one of the new things that when i was on mm -hmm. and uh, then another one was which happened after i was on the forward and planning and we went this uh kitty litter deal in uh detroit lakes uh i believe actually about a year after i was off they finally uh, purchased that mm -hmm. but i had been on that we had talked about that every meeting in forward planning and another thing we started was the uh, um, metalworks in Redwood Falls, which they build their own trailers. Uh, and uh, livestock, that was always a big issue. Commission firms, it was, it was losing money there. We had, it was, when I came on, uh, so Falls, it was out at that time. They'd sold out to Central co Commission Firm. And then it was, what was it West St. Paul? Uh, no, not West uh, St. Paul, I mean West Fargo. West Fargo. West Fargo was still on. Was St. Paul still operating then? Yes, Saint, uh, Saint, uh, and West Fargo was on. And then they went out, that was on for a couple of years. And then uh, far, uh, St. Paul, South St. Paul was on. And they tried different things, went into uh, the auction in there. And in fact, Marina and I went to visit the commission firm. And uh, then they finally sold it to uh, Central. More or less, uh, it, the, the deals was if they would take care of their employees, employers, you know, for it was just more or less a wife. And another thing we tried was uh, having hog buying stations out. But Morales had you there because they, that was the place they would always overbid you and you had to sell to Morales. Mm -hmm. So that didn't work either. We tried different things. Always tried something to try to help the farmer out, but it was always a mm -hmm. banging your head against the wall. But yeah, they had start. Had they started talking about the biodiesel thing they're in now when you were on the on the board yet? No, not uh, well. We did uh, uh, yes for grease to some mm -hmm. extent. Just the grease burning of the grease, yeah. the plain grease, because mm -hmm. the grease was so cheap. But not to the, otherwise the biodiesel, not that much. Mm -hmm. We tried different things too. We uh, had a cream separator, like a cream separator, separate the blood uh, plaza 
and then going to, uh, for baby pig feed. But that didn't pan out too good either. So we always tried new ideas continuously. Yeah. And then, of course, there were so many laws in Minnesota we had to comply by where it, the sewer deals and all this. And we More continued. so than the Dakotas. Right. right. Yeah. There's a lot of laws. And the, the managers did a good job of doing this, and they kept a good handle on it. And that's, mm -hmm. they've always been progressive, you know. When did they, when did they close down the uh, operation at DeSmet? Mm, I can't tell you that. That was just a more or less a transfer. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, I don't know what they, what year it would have been. They did have a more of a process than before, I think, than they originally. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you exactly what year it was. Okay. Uh, just like when uh, FUMPA started, of course, they started out with this trucking association from Mar from uh, Montana, mm -hmm. and then they truck stuff up to uh, to St. Paul and to West Fargo and stuff like that. Okay. Now, uh, one of the controversial issues that uh, I think it's probably passed by now, but was the question of whether or not farmers got paid or had to pay to have a, a dead animal picked up. <laughs> I'm sure you remember that. You oh yes. That a little bit. Well, it just gets us to a point you had to. It cost so much to process it, and uh, the hides weren't worth much, and you had to ship. We used to process hides to some extent and then ship them to uh, uh, St. Paul. Uh, well, I can't think of the name of the plant. We were in that one in St. Paul. But then most of the hides went to the tanneries in Korea and uh, China or wherever they went, and it just it was no money into it. And then, of course, you come with the mad cow, Mm -hmm. deal everything was is against you all the time and it got it, it just got too much yeah. you want to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, relationship with the farmers union organizations in the five states that uh, I think ultimately were became well, maybe and maybe they were by the time you joined them where they had formed farmers union enterprises I think they were they was it was there before I got started there right? that's uh, it was the five five states, and uh, it was kind of hard to understand completely how they got their money. It's different entities, you know, we had the commodity trade and then the enterprise, and, and the enterprise was the one that had the dead stock. And of course, then we gave, when I was on, I don't know what they do now, we had that metal works try to help enterprises out, give them different things. And I, there was talk, and I don't know if they are now or not, but of, of giving them this, um, kitty litter deal. I guess I shouldn't say that, but I don't know, you know, but I know that the metal works in the, uh, it seemed like our company had to to uh, kick in money all the time for the rendering company because they they just weren't making money. Uh, so if it wouldn't have been for FUMPA, uh, the enterprise would have been losing quite a bit of money because they were kicking in money to help keep the rendering company going, you know, I mean the rendering trucks going. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, and uh, Larry is on the board now. Right, so he got on and- What year was that, 2000? Two, one, it says there, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's, it's either, what, six, seven, uh, five years, I guess now, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you wanna talk a little bit about uh, people? Uh, that you remember working with over the years. Uh, anybody that particularly that stands out that you'd like to mention? Uh, in, farmers in, in Farmers Union or in the co-ops? Well, to start out with the Farmers Union, I guess Ben Radcliffe, I can always remember we used to go up in the fall of the year and county councilors and, and go over the policies for about two days and mm -hmm. and they had some very interesting gentlemen on there would talk and it uh, it got, uh, I think Maureen can remember some of them, Hilly. Uh, and uh, of course, that's where I met a lot of people, you know, Adam, and and uh, we could become friends with Adam Sadell and, and Ben and and uh, Cliff Gascon. He's about, this, uh, was on the same time I was and same age about, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Moser, Rich Moser. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then as you went on to uh, the manager of, of FUMPA, 
uh, Ed Whelan, very interesting man, cool. very intelligent man. Uh, planes too. Yeah, he built his own plane, and he used to fly for um, uh, Farmers Union in North Dakota, I believe. And the different managers, next manager was um, Gordon Sherburn, who died of a heart attack, and then we had Jerry... Letters. Letters. <laughs> and uh, then between uh, Sherburn... Um, can't think of this finance. He was for about six months. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dave uh, Mormon, and then of course Jerry Litters become manager until he retired, and then Don Davis mm-hmm. hired Don, and they was all in-house employees that we hired. We had other people that came in mm-hmm. to interview them, you know. But we always figured that these fellows knew it was a very complex company to know. And like I said, Don Davis, he came up through the ranks, so did Jerry Letters, and uh, Ed Whelan, he came, they all came up through the ranks. And so that was very good to hire them, fellas, and all, I think all the employees enjoyed that. Um, very personal, all very personal people mm-hmm. that I, I was on. Mm-hmm. How many people were working for uh, Trump at that time? 100 and Let's see, what is it, 134, or was it more than that? I just can't, I can't remember. All. Okay. I'm poor, it must have been more, it must have been more than that. Yeah. Because 334 was probably, okay. with the truck drivers and stuff. Of course, a lot of them are their own truck, uh, they own their own truck, you know, uh-huh. too. Uh-huh. Three, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, let's see. How would you uh, evaluate the... Uh, the state of agriculture today, as you we were sitting down here in, uh, on probably some pretty valuable land. Uh, you oh, may not yeah. be making a ton of money, but uh, the land is it's just, a lot more than when you got it. It's just gone out of sight, you know. I thought the most I paid for land was eight hundred dollars, and now I suppose the land is is from two to three thousand in our area, and the cash rent. Is out of hand because if they just don't get a crop with that machinery they paid and the prices is devastating. It's just it's and what they got to pay to put in the crop. I just I just can't believe it. They how they can even make it is just absolutely. And if you don't if you don't keep up with your machinery, the expensive uh, parts or, or labor is sixty dollars an hour. You know, sixty to seventy dollars an hour to go into a machine shop. Uh, Everything that plant and I uh, fertilize is well over a hundred dollars an acre. Uh, I I just I, I haven't been into it completely yet. Well, I haven't asked Larry how much it costs for the spray. It you know what in, in the seed I forget what what it would be, but I know it's tremendous. Mm-hmm. And some of them are paying a hundred and forty dollars an acre cash rent if they miss a crop, and then they they got to take out crop insurance besides all this. There's chemicals and the seed, uh, and then the diesel price. I, I guess I don't paint a good picture for them, but I, if they if they miss one crop, we've been just lucky that we've had crops lately, and that's the only thing that's helping. Of course, there, we get better yields than we had when I if we when I was there. If we got 80 bushel of yield, we were doing pretty good, real good. And what is it running these days? Well, from 150 to 180 mm-hmm. on average mm-hmm. here. I'm sure some get more, but that's about average. Yeah. I think a, a year or two years ago it was 100. They probably had 180 average, and last year it was down a little bit, probably 150. This area I'm talking about this area. Uh, cattle prices are good, but it costs a lot to get into the cattle stock cows, and dairy would be terrible. You know, I don't know what a spring and heifer would be. 2,500, I suppose. I would think. Mm-hmm. I haven't kept up on it. And I, uh, when I was, it would really change like when I was in chemical, we measured the chemical by the gallon more or less, and now it's by the ounce on some of them. Of course, Roundup is still by the gallon, but I just, uh, I've been retired since 92, and uh, I just would be out of the ball game, I guess, the farming if I had to start thinking about what it well, to have to happen, you know, mm-hmm. to go. Mm-hmm. But I was great to keep records when I farmed to uh, how many pounds of fertilizer put on and 
and I kept a little maps, and I'm sure Larry has this on his computers now, but I always drawed maps and, and tried to figure out, you know, what, what year and, and rotated crops all the time. And, of course, the crops have changed to, to what I had raised because we used to raise oats, but uh, and that was mostly for the ration and the cow. We milk cows and then forget the straw, but now it's, it's all it's either corn, soybeans, and alfalfa to some extent, you know. But um, how important do you think cooperative education is? We, we've talked about a lot about co-ops. Well, co-ops were built for service and uh, to try to have a market and to keep the prices down. You can see a lot of times when the co-ops go, the prices get higher for electricity or wherever. Uh, it, it, you have a market, uh, sometimes even petroleum, if it wouldn't be for the co-ops, they wouldn't have no, uh, big oil companies wouldn't, don't care for the farmers to haul uh, fuel out to you. And uh, like I said, there's service and all of co-op, everything is co-ops. You know, we got our raw water, our insurance, our electricity, and our, our, our um, chemicals from our farmer, our co-op elevators. Uh, if it wouldn't be for co-ops, I, I don't know where the farmer was at. They just, uh, big organizations don't care for the farmers because they, they don't believe in the farmers in a, to some extent. It's just to build and be big, to do away at the land and they forget about where they get the food from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think the co-operatives around here are all pretty much doing a good job yet? Or? Well, I guess they... <laughs> <Don't feel>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, most of them have. Most. Yeah, they really have. They have. Except in, if you, get, it depends upon the manager. Mm -hmm. If you get a bad manager, that's that's it's, you can see what happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we did have a real good crop here in Beersheet, and it was a service, and we just it just hurt, devastated people to see it go, mm -hmm. because yeah. we didn't know where we were going. But then. We did, did the, the cooperative oil company from Centerville picked up the slack to help over here, you know. Mm -hmm. But we used to have a tire service truck and everything else, and so now they have to go further. So you know what's happening when you got to go mm -hmm. further. It's going to cost the farmer more money because they have the expenses to come out, you know. Yeah, so. yeah. What do you think the biggest challenges facing not only cooperatives but farm organizations are now? Well, prices. Uh, yeah, you know, prices is one of the things. And of course, the fuel, mm -hmm. fuel. A farm organization. Well, everything comes right down to prices because if you don't get prices, uh, then some farmers don't care to pay an extra forty dollars for membership because they figure, well, that's another thing out of a pocket. And they don't, they don't see it that you got to have a lobby. You got to go to Washington D.C. to lobby. And when they get to Washington D.C. They say, how many people do you represent? And if you don't represent so many, they kind of overlook you. I don't know what the percent of farmers there is. There isn't very, what percent is there farmers in the United States now? Well, Two to four percent? Low. Yeah. That's pretty low. Compared to, you know, even 20 or 30 years ago. And I'm sure if they didn't have some help from the government, I know, I, I don't know what the farm program completely is now. But I know this is what keeps a lot of them on the farm, mm -hmm. to the farm program. Yeah. Are um, some of the farmers around here that you know invested in uh, value-added plants like the ethanol plants? Well, uh, Lester Bogolai and yep. different ones, right. There's different ones have, right. Okay. Uh, even I hear some of the bankers have invested mm -hmm. into that one in Hudson. They had so many investors okay. in that. You mentioned Washington. You've been to Washington a few times in right. lobbying groups and national conventions as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. uh, you were in Washington on 9-11. Uh, right. You want to talk about that a little bit in perspective? It's almost going on five years ago now. Well, it, it couldn't, it's unbelievable. I know when we was walking up there, this one lady stopped us and for, it was with Jim Walsh and uh, Roland Sheepman and and Jim Welch's wife and more, and this one lady stopped me as I was coming to the Rayburn building. 
and she said, you know, the Twin Towers got hit by an airplane. Well, uh, it got hit by an airplane before with a Piper Cub. It didn't mean much until we got into the office in there. And we first, we had some drop-offs, you know, to, to see to see. We didn't start until 10 o'clock, you know, oh. for our meeting. And Jim was in charge of our group. And this, we went and talked to first this one, they was on TV there. We didn't know what was still going on. And the, little, the one of the aides come out in the hallway and Jim was talking to her about what our program was. We was gonna drop off some information. And I said to Jim Edgeworth, she never heard a word you said. She was just, she was this blank in her face because it was what's going on. We didn't realize what was going on until so we got up to the fourth floor. And uh, I said to somebody, what's going on? And nobody talked. They just left. Everybody left. And we got down to the gate. They, they were down to the door. I said, we better leave. And uh, I think we took the elevator down. We got down to the door, and they were closing the big iron gate across there. And there was nothing up by the hill then. There was just state troopers going up, sirens blowing, and we walked on down the hill. And it was a complete, everything was completely... Uh, Devastating, you might say. There, people were taking down these little hamburger stands and moving out. And, and uh, we got back to Larry. I guess he was. They told him to run. I guess, but nobody ever said nothing to us. Oh. Everybody just uh, shocked them. So, and we we were this <laughs> the last ones someplace. You know, we get back to our hotels, and I would, we Roland and I were walking around kind of slow, and and uh, went to the hotel and then they just locked us down at the hotel and I guess Larry called me, saw me and he said, you better call home, you've been a half hour late, call and tell mother about it because Judy Stratman had called, used our uh, room or phone card because hers wouldn't work out of our room to call WX to tell everybody was safe and uh, Lester Vogel I roomed at me and then the next morning he looked out the window and saw this, this uh, what do you call it, checking, uh, eye out there you know security call. security check you know okay. Okay. and then of course everybody wanted to ride back to South Dakota on the yes. bus yes. 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 Maureen what was your perspective back here well I did were you watching TV no I wasn't morning, watching so? TV that morning I was down in the basement cleaning that day I decided well nobody's around it's a good day to get that done <laughs> but anyway uh, Deb called and, and she said mom have you had TV on I said, no, I'm downstairs. She said, our dad and Larry in D.C.? I said, yeah. She said, you better turn on your TV and <laughs> see what's going on. So so that was the first I knew about. And then they were showing, you know, the, the how the planes had hit and mm -hmm. the towers had already collapsed when I had turned the TV on and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so then they said there was one more plane yeah, that they were yeah. missing, and that's yeah. that kind of was scary because they said they think that's heading for the capital. That was mm -hmm. well, so, so that was uh, then. We, then I watched. <laughs> yeah, those guys in Pennsylvania had brought, took that plane down. It's the one that saved us. Yeah, I think it was heading for the capital. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. have you seen the movie? The, the no, the movie out no. of Flight ninety three. No, those folks. Yeah. no, it's kind of scary. I've seen it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one that saved us. Yeah, we were probably closer to trouble than even than we thought at the time. Right. Yeah. It's so funny. It was so peaceful. Like on Saturday night, we we went, mm -hmm. you know, walked by the Capitol, and, and we looked up and saw the light where Senator Dash's hall, uh, room was, and we told Lester he'd never been there. We are going to go there. And it was just so peaceful, walked around, and... And then that to happen, you know, like that afterwards. It's just. Mm -hmm. yeah. What kind of advice would you give somebody today if they were thinking about getting involved in uh, cooperatives or farmers union? Or farming? <laughs> no, well. You talked a little bit about some of the challenges facing people, certainly, around here. You know, well, there. Farming, of course, I think that uh, with this high-priced machinery, uh, you just about has to be a, a, a cooperative bunch of farmers to have machinery together mm -hmm. to try to save on prices. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I, well, Larry kind of does somewhat 
this cousin up here. He has a manufacturing, and I did that when I uh, farmed, and it works out better because my neighbor, one neighbor and I, Marvin Anderson, we farmed for 15 years, and that really worked out. You get labor, and it cuts your labor cost down, and it also cuts your machinery. You can have machinery together. You don't to go. That's that's one thing, and of course you still got to have your farm organizations to lobby. That's the big thing, and of course educate people. Uh, but the big thing is you have to lobby at D.C. to get to keep. I guess we got to have our government in there to try to help us, because every other every other organization, I mean, air business, uh, airplanes, and everything has the government to help them out. And they, we got to have crops, and now, like I say, with this ethanol, look at we're trying to help on this everybody with this fuel. Mm -hmm. If these if these oil companies would only back off on their price a little bit, would help a lot. And, yeah. and that's what we got to try to get our congressmen and senators to try to get onto those oil companies to give the farmers and everybody a, a break. Uh, I guess farming is a good life. Very interesting. It's, um, it's it's changed completely changed you got to be a specialist in everything you know it's the cattle feeding hog feeding it's all separate it's not like we start out general farming we ever we had a little bit of everything but that just don't seem to work anymore yeah would you describe yourself as an optimist or a pessimist I don't know what would I be a farmer has to be an optimist yeah. I guess I you know think so. I, I you I haven't been, met a pessimist yet, anyhow. Although I've met some people who had some elements of pessimism. Uh, well, if we don't make it this year, we'll make it next year. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Okay. Was there anything else you'd like to add? That, uh, any question that I didn't ask you that something is just burning in you that you want to talk about? You have anything? Think about? Mm. Well, I wasn't even passing them. <laughs> No, I can't think of anything right now. Okay. We've been visiting with Matt Bergen. Thank you for participating in the Cooperative Legacy Project.